गुड इवनिंग यस फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू डेली न्यूज एनालिसिस प्रोडी बी शंकर एस अकेडमी टुडे डेट इज फिफ्टींथ सेप्टेम्बर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फोर इन दिस वीडियो वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस थ्री इंपॉर्टेंट आर्टिकल्स द फर्स्ट आर्टिकल इज अबाउट द ट्रेड इन बैलेंस बिटवीन इंडिया एंड चाइना एंड इट इज फ्रॉम इंडियन एक्सप्रेस न्यूज पेपर द सेकंड आर्टिकल इज अबाउट द सेंसेस फ्रॉम हिस्टोरिकल पर्सपेक्ट इट इज ऑल्सो फ्रॉम इंडियन एक्सप्रेस न्यूज पेपर द थर्ड आर्टिकल इज अबाउट द डिले इन ईपीएफ पेंशन इट इज फ्रॉम हिंदू न्यूज पेपर सो दीज आर द्री आर्टिकल्स वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस इन दिस वीडियो लेट एस गेट इन द डिस्कशन लुक एट दिस आर्टिकल it talks about the growing trade imbalance between india and china recently external affairs minister mr jay shankar have criticized this growing trade deficit between the two countries so this article talks about this trade gap between india and china and this is mainly contributed to the lack of market access for indian goods in china so in this discussion let us discuss this trade imbalance between india and china look at this graph India's imports from China have grown to 100 billion dollars this year but India's exports to China is only 16 billion dollars so there exists a huge trade deficit between the two countries now what are the reasons for this trade deficit before looking at the reasons let us see what are the components of India's imports and India's exports to China the major products that are imported from China are electrical machinery chemicals manufactured goods for telecommunication pharmaceuticals and india also relies heavily on the tech products from china so these are the important imports from china if we look at india's exports to china we majorly export raw materials agricultural products like cotton iron ore see india is a global producer of pharmaceuticals and agricultural products but these agricultural products are not getting enough market access in china for example indian mangoes and grapes face regulatory hurdles in china but chinese goods are enjoying a strong market access in india so this is a major issue india is also dependent heavily on china for electronic goods for example most of the smartphones used in india are either manufactured in china or sourced from china many indian industries also rely on chinese imports for essential raw materials and components during covid-19 pandemic when there is a disruption in supply chain from china the indian industries like automobile and pharmaceuticals were heavily affected so this shows that indian industries heavily dependent on chinese imports see india was known as the pharmacy of the world because india produces a major generic drugs and pharmaceuticals but 70% of the raw materials required for drug manufacturing is imported from china so this implies india's pharmaceutical industry is heavily dependent on chinese imports now let us see the major challenges in trade relations between india and china the first important thing is non tariff barriers indian exporters face a significant non tariff barriers when trading with china it includes stringent safety measures quality regulations bureaucratic red tapeism and custom procedures so these are the non tariff barriers the next one is geopolitical tensions the ongoing border clashes between india and china particularly after galwan valley clashes in 2020 there have been an impact on trade relations so in response to this border tensions india has increased the scrutiny of chinese investments in indian market the next important thing is trade imbalance as we have seen earlier india's imports from china are increasing rapidly but india's exports to china are decreasing this is because indian goods lack market access in china's market on other hand there was a dominance of chinese manufactured products in indian market so both of these factors contribute to trade imbalance between the two countries so the lack of market access and dominance of chinese manufactured products are major reasons for the trade gap between india and china and note these important keywords now let us answer this question related to the topic which of the following indian state does not border with china this is a simple question the answer is option a west bengal with this let us conclude the discussion and move to the next news article look at this article this article talks about the census in india from historical perspective census is a comprehensive exercise conducted by government of india to collect the demographic data about the population it is one of the largest administrative exercise in the world and it has been conducted every 10 years since 1881 the recent census of 2021 was delayed due to covid-19 pandemic so in this discussion let us see the basic information provided in the article and also about the census census of india is conducted by office of register general and census commissioner which functions under ministry of home affairs now let us see the constitutional provisions article 246 it outlines the distribution of legislative powers between union and states the census falls under the union list which means that only parliament has power to legislate on matters related to census so census is kept under union list the seventh schedule also mentions that the responsibility of conducting census 
lies solely with the central government. If you look at the legal framework, this Census Act of 1948 gives the government the authority to collect demographic and socio-economic data of the population. Article 82 provides for delimitation of constituencies for Lok Sabha. But Article 170 deals with the allocation of seats in legislative assemblies based on the data collected from census. And this article deals with the delimitation of Lok Sabha seats. Census data is also used for reservation of seats. The reservation of seats for SC and ST in Lok Sabha and both state legislative assemblies are provided under Article 330 and 332. So the data for the reservation of seats is also based on census. Now let us discuss about the Mandal Commission. The Mandal Commission is also known as the second backward class commission. The first backward class commission was Kaka Collector Commission which was established in 1953. So the second backward class commission which was Mandal Commission was established in 1979 by Prime Minister Moraj Desai. The chairman of this commission was Bindeshwari Prasad Mandal. The aim of this commission was to identify the socially and educationally backward classes and recommend measures to, for their upliftment. It also includes the reservation in government jobs and educational institutions. The report of this commission was submitted in 1980 and the commission estimated that 52% of India's population belong to other backward classes. 27% reservation in government jobs and educational institutions for OBCs was recommended by this commission. This is in addition to existing 22.5% reservation for SESTs. The Mandal Commission report was implemented only in the year 1990 by Prime Minister V.P. Singh. It was announced that 27% of reservation for OBCs in central government jobs and educational institutions. So this implementation of Mandal Commission report have created widespread protest across India. Then in 1992, in Indra Savane case, the Supreme Court upheld the Mandal Commission recommendation and introduced a creamy layer concept. The creamy layer refers to economically advanced section of OBC who are excluded from reservation benefits. Under this case, the Supreme Court has imposed 50% cap on total reservations, that is the reservation for both SEST and OBC. Article 15 and Article 16 empower government to make special provisions for socially and economically backward sections. So these articles empowered the government to make special provisions for reservation. Now let us discuss prelims question. The density of population of India from the census 1951 and census 2001 have increased but not more than three times. So this statement is incorrect. Between these two census, the annual growth rate of population of India has doubled. This is also incorrect. There is increase in annual growth rate but it was not doubling. So both of the statements are incorrect. The correct answer is option D. Now look at this article. It discusses the growing concerns among PF pensioners regarding the delay in processing of applications. Only a few fraction of applicants have received pension payment orders. So what are the issues faced by EPFO pensioners and what is the union government's position on PF pension reforms? So this is what we are going to discuss in this article. In 2022, the Supreme Court ruled that EPF members, that is employees provident fund members can receive pensions based on their actual wages, even if those wages exceeded the previously set ceiling under EPS scheme. Before this Supreme Court ruling, the pensions were calculated on limited salary capping the benefits. So the Supreme Court ruling has increased the eligible pensioners to claim higher pension. So this has created many challenges for central government in processing the pension applications. There were over 17.5 lakh applications of EPF pensions still pending. Only around 8,000 pensions were issued till now. And union government has said many reasons for this delay in pensions. The first reason is financial constraints. The union government is saying that there is a budgetary limitations and there is no proper budget allocation for increased pension amounts. So it also leads to huge revenue expenditure for government. The next reason is annual contribution. The government contributes 1.16% of basic wages to employment providence. So now the annual contribution is also increased and this leads to challenges for union government. The government is also opposed to higher pensions which was ruled by Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has liberalized the pensions and increased the pension for higher wages. So this is affecting the economically weaker workers and it is not sustainable according to the central government. Then there is a reverse subsidy concern. EPFO says that high wage earners should not benefit disproportionately from a scheme which is designed for benefiting low wage workers. So after the Supreme Court ruling, the scheme is highly beneficial to only high wage earners and not for low wage workers. So this is disproportionately affecting the weaker sections according to central government. So these are the reasons cited by central government 
for delay in allowing pensions. Now let us see some way forward for this. Central government have to raise the contributions to EPS scheme for better pension payouts. Updating the current 15,000 wage ceiling for provident fund contributions because this was set a decade ago and this needs to be changed. Providing the employees the choice to invest in either EPF or NPS scheme. Removing the 2014 cutoff date. So this makes the EPS 95 applicable to all employees regardless of their salary levels. Then the last one is about the simplifying the document requirements for pensioners and employers to ensure the smooth processing of pension payments. So these are some of the way forward or steps that can be suggested for easier processing of pensions. Now let us discuss an MCQ question. Which of the following statements regarding EPFO is are correct? EPFO functions under Ministry of Labor and Employment. Yes, this statement is correct. EPFO administers Employment Provident Fund, Employees Pension Scheme, Employees Deposit Linked Insurance Scheme. Yes, this statement is also correct. EPFO is responsible for providing health insurance to its members. No, this statement is incorrect. So the correct answer for this question is option A. 1 and 2 only. Now we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video, please like, comment and share. Don't forget to subscribe to Shankar AS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.